Thank you, Raju. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you about squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, I'm giving this presentation on behalf of uh, many collaborators, uh, the most notable of which are uh, Dr. Uh, Adele El Nagar from MD Anderson and Dr. Jennifer Grandis from the University of Pittsburgh, who are the co chair of the uh, Head and Neck Cancer uh, Disease Working Group, uh, along with myself, and uh, many members of the Analysis Working Group. I'm going to try to give credit where credit is due as I go through the talk. Um, but that may not be possible in every case just because there's so many, uh, there's so many contributors. Uh, and I actually shown, uh, shown here are uh, participants at the face-to-face -face meeting that took place at UNC Chapel Hill <clears throat> in September of this year. Um, so just to point out that, that uh, folks were willing to contribute uh, two or three days of their time to come and, and work on this data, and, and I greatly appreciate that. Okay, so head and neck cancer is an important cancer. It's the number five cancer, most, uh, the fifth most common cancer worldwide. Uh, 500,000 cases per year, 200,000 uh, deaths. Uh, there are parts of Asia where it's the most common uh, cancer, usually that's uh, in the case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. In the United States, it's the number six uh, 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 most common cancer with 45,000 cases per year um, and approximately uh, 20,000 deaths per year. The two common risk factors, uh, smoking with about 80% attributable risk, so 80% of head and neck cancer is attributable to smoking, uh, but a, a rising and well-described epidemic of human papilloma virus associated uh, carcinomas as well. And with that in mind, I've included a cartoon um, uh, on the slide, not so much to, to really go through the details of, of, how head and, uh, of, of how HPV causes head and neck cancer, but just to get some vocabulary out there because I'm going to refer to these. Uh, these markers uh, many times. Um, for the most part, we're talking about HPV type 16. Uh, HPV type 16 makes two oncoproteins, E6 and E7. Um, e, uh, E6 uh, targeting uh, P53 and E7 targeting RB. Um, if you look again at the cartoon, you'll get a sense of some of the other important players in HP, uh, HPV infection, and, and you'll also see these uh, emerge as important players in head and neck cancer as well, and I'll point uh, particularly to <clears throat> the, the cyclin, uh, particularly cyclin D1, um, and again uh, P16, and it's probably worth mentioning that, that P16 plays a, 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 uh, an important role here both as a biomarker and as part of the pathophysiology. The biomarker role is, uh, is due to the fact to the fact that HPV-infected cells express high levels of P16 uh, because of re reciprocal uh, signaling, so uh, immunohistochemistry of P16 is, is one of the, the most, if not the most common uh, diagnostic, clinical diagnostic test for uh, HPV infection. Uh, the data that I'm talking about today are the 279 samples that are part of the data freeze. Um, we have a data freeze so that we can actually uh, do, do the analyses. There will ultimately be uh, 500 uh, cases of head and neck cancer included. Um, to be a, a case, uh, the, the sample had to have exon sequencing, tumor SNP chips, RNA sequencing, methylation, and microRNA um, sequencing. Um, I will say that there's a lot of other data uh, that uh, included in the data freeze um, uh, that, that, that will get used eventually, including RPPA data, so protein um, expression data, but that is not uh, available in absolutely every sample. Let me describe the, d the demographics of the patient population. The median age of our patients was 61. This is a little bit older than the SEER uh, median age in, in the United States of 57. Um, Ten percent of the patients are minorities, mostly African Americans. Uh, Twenty percent of the patients are never smokers, which seems a little bit high. Um, that may be some missing data, but um, in any case, that's the data that, that we've got. Seventy-three percent of the patients are male. That's about uh, right for the United States. In Europe, you'll see um, up to 90 percent of head and neck cancer will be in, in males. Eleven percent of the, of the patients positive for HPV um, as defined by uh, sequencing, and I'll get into that in a, in a couple minutes. 62% um, of the cases are from oral cavity, 26% larynx, 11% oropharynx, and 1% hypopharynx. Most of the, pa the patients are advanced stage uh, with 57% having stage 4A disease. Head and neck cancer is a little unusual in the staging in that 4A does not mean incurable. This just means there's a large tumor uh, with a large lymph node or multiple lymph nodes. Stage 4C is metastatic disease. 
and about 40% of the patients were alive at the time of the last follow-up. I will mention one challenge that we've, we've struggled with, which is HPV status. Um, here on the, on the screen, I'm showing seven different ways that a patient could be potentially identified as HPV positive. And so we're wrestling in the data set right now with actually defining uh, which case is which based on RNA sequencing, DNA sequencing, uh, clinical um, uh, history, and, and other factors. And, and this is important for reasons that will become clear later. But I'll, I'll just have some conclusions on the cohort that we have. Um, I think this needs to be emphasized that uh, the, the current data freeze, which is only half of the head and neck cancer samples that will be available, is already the largest data set, uh, genomic data set, for head and neck cancer uh, that I'm aware of um, that has ever been uh, assembled uh, by a factor of two for even the individual components. So these 279 cases is twice the number of expression data that are available through any other source, uh, more than twice the number of copy number arrays, et cetera, et cetera. And the data are, um, th there are clinical data that are avail uh, available as well, and, and again, the data are all integrated. This is an unbelievable resource. I think of all the TCGA tumors so far, this is probably the tumor that was in most in need of, of, uh, of, of this, uh, this uh, contribution, and uh, we will be hearing about this for a decade or more. This is an incredible resource. There are some limitations, however. Um, this is a surgical cohort, so there are relatively few oropharynx cases relatively few HPV-positive cases, and a few smaller tumors, so these are the lower-risk tumors, so there are some limitations, um, but nonetheless, a data set to be uh, quite excited about. Um, uh, now, moving on to the, to the DNA data, um, this is the famous Gaddy, um, uh, Gaddy Getz figure uh, from the Broad, and probably everyone at the Broad can make this now, but um, making an important point, which is that head and neck cancer has a very high mutation rate, somewhere between 1 and 10 mutations per megabase of sequencing, not quite as high as lung squamous cell carcinoma, but probably dragged down a little bit by the fact that HPV-positive tumors have lower mutation rates. This is a, a fairly mature version of a figure that's really a key deliverable uh, in the marker paper. Um, and I, actually, I'm going to go to something that, that uh, Matthew Meyerson said this morning, which is that at this point, um, this group, the, the disease working group, there is no way that we can even begin to scratch the surface on this data. Our goal is to um, move the TCGA data forward into the community, to present the data, to introduce the data, to show what's, what, uh, we can, what can be done with the data. Now, we are going to make some novel observations, but I think the main point is to not get in the way of others analyzing this data, and so that's our goal. But uh, looking at the significantly mutated gene list, you'll see some uh, many common uh, many expected players, uh, number one, uh, CDK and 2A, or the gene that, uh, that generates the P16 um, uh, protein product. Uh, so that's already interesting because I've already brought in the HPV story in P16, and I'm going to get back to this a couple more times. Uh, P53, as expected, uh, some, some perhaps unexpected genes, so CASP8 is an interesting target, and I'll talk about this in a minute as well, and another interesting target, HLA-A, uh, one of the MHC class 1 uh, proteins. I'll get back to that as well. Um, anyone who's, uh, who's spent much time involved in these uh, large sequencing projects will know that the significantly mutated gene list is a highly parameterized analysis which means that if you tweak the parameters a little bit, you can generate vastly different lists of, of, of mutations. And, and many of those tweaks can be very reasonable. Um, and if you, if you do that and you go through the list a few times and, and consider some different ways to look at the, the mutated gene list, one of the observations you'll see is that the, the significantly mutated genes is highly overlapping with lung squamous cell carcinoma. In fact, of the top mutated genes in lung squamous cell carcinoma, only P10 and KEEP1 failed to to uh, commonly emerge on the significantly mutated gene list from head and neck cancer. Um, although there are KEEP1 and P10 mutations, that never rises to the level of significantly mutated. So I think this is one of the, I'm, I'm going to pause on one of the early key observations, uh, which is that HPV negative head and neck cancer looks a lot like uh, lung squamous cell carcinoma. And that's in terms of its mutational landscape, its copy number landscape, expression patterns, and pathway activations. Um, data that I'm not going to show, mostly because it's not my data, but we've, uh, because of TCGA, we've been able to get some early looks at it, is that HPV-positive head and neck cancer looks a lot like other HPV-positive tumors. I think we'll see a little bit of that through, through, the, um, through the meeting here. Um, <clears throat> but it, it does justify uh, even, even more that we need to start thinking about these tumors in different ways. And so I've just highlighted one of these thoughts here, 
which is the idea that, the, that some, of the tar some of the key mu mutations might be different between HPV positive and HPV negative tumors. Um, here's one example with PIK3CA showing a mutation rate of 35% in HPV positive samples and 19% in HPV negative samples. This is assuming that 34 of the, of the tumors were HPV positive and 254 negative, and you're starting to see why it's so important that we get our HPV calls uh, correct. I'm also going to show you later why it's challenging to get these calls uh, correct. Just one slide on the whole genome analysis just to remind um, us that we have it. We've got some very interesting cases, but we really haven't had the time yet to, um, to develop the whole genome story, so I'm really not going to talk about these further today. But there are approximately 30 whole genomes that have been done for head and neck cancer. Going into the uh, copy number landscape a little bit, I think this is one of the key observations, and this will, um, I think will be a figure in the marker paper showing um, uh, lung squamous cell carcinoma copy number landscape, so this is the genome from chromosome one through all the uh, autosomes, uh, HPV negative tumors, HPV positive tumors, and from 10,000 feet, you can clearly see that these tumors um, that, that, that share many of the same copy number alterations, uh, universal alterations of losses of chromosome 3P, gains of 3Q, um, uh, alterations in chromosome 8. But there are some, there are, uh, some differences, and I'll go through these um, in, in some of the uh, subsequent slides. Looking at the focal amplifications between uh, head and neck cancer and lung cancer, really very similar patterns of uh, focal gains, but a couple of exceptions. Um, PDGFRA, for example, the peak for PDGFRA on chromosome 4 completely absent in head and neck cancer, um, but otherwise largely uh, very similar lists. Comparing HPV positive tumors to HPV negative tumors, um, this is an observation I should have uh, already given some credit to An uh, Andy Cherniak, who generated a lot of these figures um, and has been a great collaborator uh, on this project, um, is that in the HPV positive tumors, really a striking lack of oncogenes other than PIK3CA, uh, perhaps a little bit in, ter um, in terms of some CCND1, cyclin D1 amplifications, but uh, overwhelmingly PIK3CA compared to a much uh, deeper selection of oncogenes in the HPV negative tumors. And I think this is a novel observation. And, and again, gets back to uh, the importance of uh, looking at that mutation rate for, of PIK3CA in HPV positive tumors. In terms of focal deletions between HPV positive and negative tumors, um, one uh, in particular uh, is striking, uh, and this is a deletion on chromosome 11. Um, so, uh, and this reminds me, uh, and I'm going to make this conclusion a couple of times, that uh, the, the copy number landscape in head and neck cancer is, uh, appears to be very rich in terms of defining its biology, perhaps more so than the, the mutation spectrum in, in some cases. One of the challenges with copy number alterations, even focal events, is that uh, sometimes three or four or ten or twenty uh, potential oncogenes occur within the amplicon, and so we've, this is one of our challenges, is defining the key gene within the amplicon. Um, I will point out that TRAF3 um, does its gene expression and its copy number track in this deletion. The red samples are the HPV positive samples, so it's certainly quite intriguing that this could be the target of the, of the, the 11, uh, chromosome 11 deletion. Okay, again, uh, uh, all right. So you saw this morning that uh, Chad Creighton showed, um, clearly they spent uh, time in the renal cell carcinoma paper validating the mutations or coming up with a, the, a list of the most credible um, uh, mutations. Uh, in the head and neck cancer uh, project, we've moved, we've taken a somewhat different approach from having multiple centers call the mutations to using the RNA-seq data to validate the mutations. This is a very powerful technique because you have an independent sample, an independent sequencing, independent alignment, and then you're checking the mutations. And uh, the way to read the figure is every column is a sample. Um, the height of the blue bar is the total number of mutations from that sample. The height of the yellow bar is, is the, um, the, the number of, of the blue bar that actually had any coverage in RNA. So was the mutant base covered with any RNA whatsoever, even a single read? The red bar is the, the fraction of samples that, if that, if that uh, mutation was covered, was it validated in RNA? And if you think back to Chad's figure this morning where essentially all that was happening there was uh, folks using the same DNA to call mutations, um, I think you'll see that the, that, uh, the RNA confirmation rate compares very favorably um, in, uh, from independent sequencing reactions. And so here we're, we're seeing uh, greater than 80 percent uh, validation if the base was covered. 
the RNA seq is an incredibly rich source um, for structural variants uh, in the transcriptome. And I'm really not going to have time to get into this uh, much today other than to give you a couple of conclusions. One is that at this early point, and I, this is up for debate and needs to be validated, there's really not any uh, convincing evidence uh, that, that there are recurrent in-frame gene fusion events. And this is similar to what we saw with lung squamous cell carcinoma, so these are sort of in-frame oncogenes. However, there's quite convincing evidence that uh, structural rearrangements in the DNA and the resulting transcripts are functional uh, more likely in terms of uh, uh, oncogene, I'm sorry, tumor suppressor gene inactivation and, and loss, and I think this is a novel observation that we're going to uh, we're going to try to make. Shifting gears a little bit and, and thinking about some of the patterns that Lou Stout showed us this morning, thinking about the use of uh, expression analysis to identify molecular subtypes of uh, of head and neck cancer or of, of any tumor type. Uh, I'm going to start with the example from lung squamous cell carcinoma, uh, the manuscript that was published in September of this year in Nature, where we described four subtypes of lung squamous cell carcinoma, classical, primitive, basal, and secretory. There are many stories in these data, but I'll, I'll just pull out one uh, for, for the illustration today, uh, which is that the classical subtype of lung squamous cell carcinoma is associated with uh, near universe, universal alterations of keep and nerf. Um, and, and one of the ways it's going to be identified is by high expression of NFE2L2 in all of the classical subtype. Um, we've performed a similar analysis in head and neck cancer in samples that were available from UNC, then validated in uh, TCGA data. And I'll just tell you that we've, we've borrowed some of the names and, and uh, generated some new names. The names in this case are atypical, classical, mesenchymal, and basal. Um, here I'm showing independent validation of the, pa the patterns in uh, samples from UNC and independent TCGA samples. Here I'm showing a centroid validation of these four subtypes um, from what's really the marker paper for head and neck cancer subtypes published by Christine Chung in 2004. And this uh, analysis uh, performed by Von Walter shows that the subtypes of head and neck cancer correlate uh, strongly with those same subtypes from lung cancer. So for the basal subtype of head and neck cancer and lung cancer, there's a single, um, there's a single uh, unified node. Uh, uh, the mesenchymal and the secretory subtype correspond, and the classical subtypes from the two groups correspond. Finding uh, expression subtype is certainly interesting, but it's, it, it's just a novelty until you can uh, propose a model for that subtype or what the genomic alteration might be. This is a particularly exciting one. Um, where in the uh, atypical subtype, and I'll just, uh, for the sake of time, uh, also point out that this is the subtype that's associated with HPV-positive infection, and so the HPV-positive patients um, uh, are almost all fall in the atypical subtype, have a completely absent amplification of chromosome 7, and, and most notably, uh, no instances of the focal high-level amplification at the EGFR locus, and this is true both in uh, data from UNC as well as in the Cancer Genome Atlas data. Again, suggesting that the PIK3CA uh, oncogene in these samples may be the, the, the relevant oncogene. Again, thinking in a pathway manner, uh, looking at expression of NFE2L2, and again, you'll see in uh, samples from UNC as well as from the Cancer Genome Atlas, universal expression of NFE2L2 in the classical subtype as well as the atypical subtype but absent in the basal and the mesenchymal, and this is the same story from, from head and neck cancer. Um, I mentioned early on mutations of HLA-A, um, which were reported in lung squamous cell carcinoma, which we were also seeing in, in head and neck cancer. It's a very interesting um, mutation. It was probably the most unexpected mutation, which is one reason why we didn't comment on it very much in the lung squamous paper. Um, so <clears throat> in, in this instance, what I'm doing is I'm using the tumor subtypes uh, to, to explore this mutation, which is otherwise sort of a curious event. Um, and let me walk you through the, the figure. In the top of the figure, um, what's being represented is gene expression, and it turns out that HLA, HLA A, B, and C are all right next to each other on chromosome 6, and they share a very coordinated gene expression, so I've just collapsed them for the sake of, of, uh, of display. The same thing is true for copy number alteration, and TAP uh, 1 and 2 are also on chromosome 6 right next to each other, so they have sort of a coordinated um, pattern. In the middle of the figure, I'm showing the copy number. Uh, here I'm showing mutations of HLA, A, B, and C, TAP1 and 2, and here I'm showing uh, DNA and RNA detection of HPV. So uh, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, point out a couple of the patterns. Oh, and one other thing. Um, as a proxy for lymphocyte infiltrates, uh, we've got expression of, of CD3 and CD8 um, as, uh, as markers of um, 
uh, infiltration into the tumors. And what you'll see in the classical subtype, universal lack of expression of HLA, A, B, and C, and in large part due to deletions of the gene, but not, not universally uh, so. Um, for the most part, most of the HLA, A, B, and C mutations occur in the basal subtype, and these are always universal, these are mutually exclusive. Um, so I don't have time, I guess, to, to, spend, to dwell on the figure too much, but this is one of the early views of helping us to try to understand a mutation which was otherwise quite curious, now starting to see some signals that actually there might be pathway activation and signaling in a coordinated way. Um, speaking of pathways, um, for those who have been involved in TCGA and other large sequencing projects for the last five to seven years, we spent a lot of time thinking about RAS signaling, um, uh, AKT, P10. Well, one of the great pleasures of working with the, the current group is not only do we have new faces, uh, we've also got new expertise, and so we've really expanded our, our thought process in terms of uh, some of the pathways and the targets that we should be looking at. Um, this is a figure generated by uh, uh, Carter Van Weiss. I'm not sure if he's here today, but it's, it has really been contributed greatly to this project. Pulling out um, really survival and death pathways, um, which, which we have not looked at in our sequencing projects before. And again, I'm going to go back to Lou Stout's story this morning, thinking about coordinated events, those mutations that occur together um, or um, in, in an anti-correlated manner. Um, there's a lot going on in this slide, so I'm only going to talk you through one of the stories. But um, I mentioned earlier on uh, mutations of CAS caspase 8 and HRAS. So one of the very curious findings is that caspase 8 uh, mutations uh, occur only in the basal and the mesenchymal subtype and frequently uh, in conjunction with HRAS mutations. When there is a mutation of HRAS uh, or caspase, there is never an amplification of CCND1. Uh, which is the 11Q uh, amplicon, which happens to also be right next to, F, uh, to FAD. The, the, it's unclear which of those two genes might be the true target of the 11Q13 um, uh, amplicon, but, uh, but the pattern is, is um, unmistakable. Uh, for those patients that have amplifications of CCND1 or FAD uh, and, and expression of those oncogenes, um, they have universally low expression of, a second, of genes from a second amplicon on 11Q, uh, 11Q22, that, uh, with additional uh, death-related um, uh, oncogenes, um, YAP1 and BRP2. So some patterns emerging, uh, you know, I think this is, these are some of the patterns that we're going to be evaluating um, as we move forward with this manuscript. Um, in, in the interest of time, I really don't have, this is just not the, the, the time to talk about all the data types. Um, I will say we've seen some amazing contributions fr um, from British Columbia, as we have in other tumors, uh, with identification of uh, tumor subtypes based on microRNA and some of the earliest looks at uh, differential clinical outcomes within these data sets. Uh, similarly, um, there's, uh, and if you have time to come by the, the poster, I'm, I'll show you some great examples of coordinated methylation gene expression data, particularly for P16, a very interesting story, and also description of methylation subtypes um, by the group, uh, by the uh, methylation uh, uh, genome characterization centers. Um, finally, I think this is my, my last slide. One of the most exciting um, observations is through unbiased sequencing for the first time being able to, um, because it's unbiased, to detect uh, DNA and RNA that we weren't looking for. And in this case, uh, it's, it's viral RNA. Um, what, so what I'm showing here, um, and, and this, is, uh, this is data that's, that's described in detail in a poster by Matt, Matt Wilkerson in the poster session, is the fraction of patients here on the top row, the fractions of patients that express some HPV type 16 RNA. Um, What's interesting about this is that this, uh, this rate, approximately 20 percent, is far higher than the number that have a clinical diagnosis of HPV infection. Um, and it's also far higher than you would expect based on the fact that only 11 percent of these patients um, are, have oral pharynx tumors. In addition, there, there, are, other viruses in, um, there are other viruses in the tumor uh, that are also detected at high levels, and I, again, I'll refer you to Matt's poster, but most prominently uh, herpes virus, um, and, and we have near universal coverage of the herpes genome in at least two of the samples. Uh, we'll, we'll get some more insight into uh, viral sequencing in a talk that's given tomorrow from, uh, uh, from Raju's group. So uh, final word, uh, thanks uh, to, the, to the contributors, and uh, we look forward to getting this data out into the public.
Thank you. One question. Yeah, uh, this is Yujin Huang from Arkansas. So very nice uh, result, I mean, related to the molecular subtype. I'm very interested in that, and uh, I'd like to talk with you more on later on, on this topic. Uh, my, I have a question related, indeed, uh, related to the TCGA sample. Like uh, on our computational side, when we do further sub computational analysis, uh, all with the new technology developer, so is the TCGA the same sample for later on, like uh, for further verification or further uh, new technology. So, I mean, TCJ, when they prepare for the sample, do they save um, extra sample for later on computational verification? Um, I think the short answer is sometimes. Um, sometimes there's extra sample available. Um, Kenna is shaking her head yes. And when there is, the program team has been very, and, there, and there's an important question they have made those samples available, um, but the samples are ultimately limited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. 